Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today about our research and product development my team is working on at Aspire Women's Health. I am Dr. Leslie Northrup, the Chief Scientific Officer at Aspire Women's Health, and I'm a trained molecular biologist and a clinical molecular geneticist. As a scientist, we are always reading articles and journals in the field of science that best fits the focus of our research at this moment in time. I also like to find meaningful books in the same subject matter. Recently, I purchased a book by Dr. Azra Raza, a well-known oncologist at Columbia University Medical Center and New York Presbyterian Hospital. She's a leading expert on leukemic cancers, specifically myodysplastic syndrome. There's actually a section in the beginning of the book that resonated with me and I wanted to share as this is the focus of my team's research and goals as it pertains to developing new clinical diagnostic tasks for ovarian cancer. The first bullet point I think really resonates in that 30 to 40 percent of all cancers can be cured today when implementing a technology to detect early markers of cancer such as somatic DNA driver mutations epigenetic changes, cancer-specific RNA and proteins, as well as cancer-specific metabolites and biological samples by employing molecular techniques. The second quote that really resonated with me was actually re-quoted by Dr. Bert Vogelstein, who is a pioneer in the field of oncology and early detection of cancer. His statement is that 50 years from now, cancer deaths could go down 75% just through prevention early detection and development of newer strategies to deal with early rather than late stage disease. As you'll find throughout the talk, this is where our team is focused on developing clinical diagnostic based tests for early detection versus late detection and applying all these molecular markers as mentioned previously. So today, this is our reality. This is a snapshot of all the challenges we are up against in developing diagnostic tests for gynecologic cancers. We are dealing with a disease that has a high mortality rate, greatly unrecognized and underfunded with a huge health care cost. The most critical factor is time, as you can see in the upper right hand corner. If the diagnosis of the cancer is in late stage and only has about a 17% survival rate, depending on the type of histology detected. Whereas if it's diagnosed early, 90% survival rate. So as you can see, time is, on, is the essence, and it's really the early detection and prevention is where we're going to increase the survival rate for women inflicted with ovarian cancer. Also, another interesting fact is that the greater incidence in death in ovarian cancer versus breast cancer. Breast cancer affects one in 10 women, where greater than one to two women die with ovarian cancer. There's also an increased mortality in different ethnic populations. For instance, in black women versus white women, the five-year mortality rate is higher versus white women. And this is really our focus here at Aspire Women's Health is that we are developing tests for all women, not one race or ethnicity. So the reason that most women are detected in late stage is because of the current tools used today to detect, let alone diagnose ovarian cancer is inadequate. The first line of detection is clinical assessment. In the pelvic cavity, an anexal mass must be large enough to visualize by transvaginal ultrasound and is subjective based on the clinician's interpretation of morphology characteristics. Anexal masses are a common clinical finding and may present symptomatically or incidentally. The majority of them are benign and most can be confidently characterized by ultrasound. However, there is a small percentage of those that present as borderline tumors or invasive cancers. Ultrasound is the first line imaging modality, allowing the characterization of most anexal masses, but not all. The problem is imaging features indicative of malignancy overlap with benign pathologies. There's a range of diagnostic sensitivity of 67 up to 99% and specificity starting at 77 up to 99%. With these varying ranges, subjective interpretation it requires an on-visit with an expensive medical assessment, 
sometimes no access to care, multiple women go undetected for too long. The second line of detection is blood tumor markers. The most, recently, uh, the most readily used biomarker is CA125. It's been around for 40 years. It has a poor performance and it's best at detecting late stage cancers and only one histology epithelial ovarian cancers with sensitivities ranging between 61 to 90%, while specificity between 35 and 91%. The third line of detection is tissue analysis. This is the only true diagnostic, which requires an invasive surgery, full removal of the anexal mass with pathology assessment. You cannot biopsy an anexal mass as it would increase rupture risk, and if a malignant mass, would increase spread. Currently, clinicians utilize all three of these technologies to determine if a woman is at risk of ovarian cancer. Currently today, the only screening, which I say lightly, methodologies is through hereditary genetic testing. However, there is still a hindrance in offering this testing for all, as you must present family and or personal history to receive covered testing by your insurance. If all women were offered genetic testing, we could mitigate risk early and let women know to increase their screening capabilities. BRCA being the most prevalent known and most well-studied gene as it's associated risk with breast cancer first, then ovarian cancer. However, as you can see in the pie graph on the left, in combination with hereditary and familial risk, you're only looking at about 20% of cancers is due to a germline risk and the majority of the cancers are actually due to sporadic, sporadic findings. We need better diagnostic tools for detecting these sporadic cancers. If you walk through the BRCA stats on the right and you look closely, one in 75 is the lifetime risk of ovarian cancer in the general population if you're carrying a germline variant for the BRCA gene. You also have an increased 40% lifetime risk for ovarian cancer, and 15% of the ovarian cancer cases are due to mutations in one of two genes. However, as you can see outlined in the red box, there's currently no effective routine screening test for ovarian cancer. And currently today, if a woman is identified with a positive BRCA variant, the tools used today were those covered on the previous slide with low varying diagnostic accuracy. Now we're going to turn over to the technology. And, it, and here we have a very basic schematic representation of the benefits of liquid biopsy over tissue biopsy. The most obvious being is the invasive versus minimally invasive approach. The greatest advantage of liquid biopsy is the technology, if it's developed smartly with the right markers, it can be used as early detection, clinical diagnostic tests. And when tested in, in the correct patient population, it can be developed and validated as a screening-based test. However, with early detection, there is tremendous benefits, but also poses several challenges. Let's first review the benefits. Number one, it has potential to remove invasive tissue biopsy in the future. It provides a very safe and non-invasive alternative with a simple blood draw. Number two, early detection is key. Mortality rate can be reduced by 90% in ovarian cancer, which is a huge unmet need in this patient population. Number three, it allows to build upon the population level screening data collected to further refine the screening methods to identify high risk women due to germline variants. However, with everything in life, benefits always comes with challenges. Currently, in gynecologic cancer, there is no other screening test apart from the pap smear for cervical cancer. In other gyne cancer, specifically ovarian cancer, we are starting from the beginning. This is novelty and a new age development in developing tests that can be an early diagnostic tool. Specific to early detection, the amount of various analytes such as microRNA, cell tumor DNA, and proteins, which I'll go into further, have such a low fraction of quantities or signals that no single analyte shows high enough performance in detection. And hence, their integration is highly recommended, which possesses its own technical and logistical issues, such as integration framework, 
larger blood draw due to multiple experiments, et cetera. Third, due to the small fractions of detecting signal or amount of analytes, the biochemistry and detection pipelines have to be highly sensitive and highly accurate in order to remove false negatives. And overall, there's a lot of development that is required in developing a liquid biopsy-based test. However, we don't let that deter us from getting to our goal of developing a test for early detection of wearing cancer. So for instance, here's a nice example, another schematic showing you differences in liquid biopsy targets. There are multiple biological targets and analytes that can be used for these purposes, such as cell tumor cells, immune cells, protein, cell-free RNA, DNA, and exosomes. These six different targets that can be measured and quantified for different biological functions. It's very heterogeneous, and so their integration of their expression and signal possesses another technical problem. There are approaches being developed, and we will discuss these in the next few slides. This is a heavy slide, and I really just want to go over the information here from a high level and review a key um, main point. First is, is that the small percentage of cell-free DNA is made up of cell tumor DNA. There's very early promise in measuring cell tumor DNA as a diagnostic therapeutic liquid biopsy detection test, lung cancer being the most promising to date with the EGFR gene that has therapeutic targets. Most prevalent detection is currently in late stage cancer detection. How can we leverage this technology to work for us in early stage detection? Well, there's things that we need to be, that are required in developing a test of this nature. One is it requires ultra sensitive methodologies at a very low percent of tumor allelic fraction. It requires specific cell-free DNA concentration to detect early stage cancers. There's issues that can arise because of random fragmentation. It can affect the targeted enrichment of your libraries of the genes in which you want to assess. For example, PCR primer artifacts, which can compete with true variant detection. Your panel targets, it's critical on the efficiency and diagnostic accuracy on what you include in your panel in the liquid biopsy detection. This lies with limitations in developing a pan-cancer test, whereas if you're limited on your target content when targeting multiple tissue types versus one tissue type of cancer, this arises where it increases the economics of your test for clinical diagnostics, as well as limits the amount of targets that you can have in your panel. So when designing a liquid biopsy-based test, the most crucial part is development of the chemistry and the target size of your panel. On the right here, you'll see a schematic example of a different type of target capture using NGS-based methodologies. Really what you want to do is you want to make sure that your targets are most informative of the disease detection that you're questioning. You want highly informative targets dictating treatment, specific association with the cancer type, as well as identify driver mutations of the disease that leads towards treatment design options, such as mentioned earlier with lung cancer and EGFR mutations. You also want the technology to be cost effective. You want to ensure that you can have high throughput diagnostics and a clinical paradigm. The most important being in the design is these unique molecular indices, or as we call UMIs. These are important to include in your chemistry design in that, so that you can rule out artifacts. You can rule out sequencing as well as PCR error rate artifacts versus the true variant detection of disease. The other key component is you really need to get down to a low tumor allelic fraction. However, the error rate of PCR and sequencing can come into play as a key factor because the lower level of detection of the variant is harder to identify. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. And so one way to go about this is you add these UMIs. You can either do single or dual UMIs. So you have them on either end of the three and five prime ends of the PCR ample cons. And utilizing these, it reduces the redundancy, it allows redundancy to develop consensus between the fragments. And then it also allows you to be able to clearly identify artificially induced errors 
versus true mutations from the same soma. The second key component to consider is the bioinformatics pipeline. For example, here is a high-level overview of the bioinformatics pipeline that is industry standard in NGS germline variant analysis. This is a rather simplified pipeline, and there's a lot of other steps that go in between each component. However, there are three main pillars. You have your primary, your secondary, and tertiary analysis. The primary includes the library that's loaded on the sequencer and demultiplexing of the indices with multiple quality control checks. Once this is done, it goes into secondary analysis. This includes major steps of alignment to your reference genome. Predominantly used today is the HG19 GR37 genome, as well as you will do your variant calling in the secondary analysis. Of course, this is very simplified as it's a very computationally heavy and demanding phase of the pipeline, with somewhere between 10 and 15 steps. What you get at the secondary analysis is a set of raw variances. You then apply these raw variances into your tertiary analysis is where you start to filter and do the annotation and identification against well-utilized, characterized data sets from third parties, such as NOMAD, to really classify the variant annotation as well as it's been observed in affected populations to determine if not it's a pathogenic variant. However, I think it's important for us to do a comparison of bioinformatic pipelines for liquid biopsy versus the standard used in germline detection. So here's a more detailed view. You'll notice there are three major differences between a standard bioinformatic pipeline and the one which is used for early detection of cancer, such as cell tumor DNA. Across the top, you have the four main steps, ultra deep sequencing, UMIs, error detection, and site-specific thresholds. The top representation of sequencing data is showing you germline sequencing bioinformatics, where the cell tumor DNA sequencing bioinformatics. The first difference is in the cell tumor DNA pipeline requires ultra deep sequencing as compared to germline genomic DNA sequencing because you have such a smaller amount of content of DNA being sloughed off from the tumor in the blood. Secondly, the UMRs are the most important design of the chemistry to confirm a true call. They differentiate the PCR errors from a genuine variant in the sample. Then third is the error correction. Realignment to match to the correct breakpoint differentiates the true from artifacts, similar to realignment around indels as detected in germline detection. Finally, in cell tumor DNA pipeline, a hard-coded mutant allele fraction threshold to classify variants as true calls or artifacts. And the underlining idea is that the different mutations have different mutation frequencies and one threshold won't work for all. Setting a hard-coded allelic fraction for identifying rare variants is a common practice in germline pipeline. However, this won't work in cell tumor DNA pipeline. So now I'd like to transition the talk to highlight all the different biological markers that can be detected in liquid biopsy detection and their use in research in clinical diagnostics. The first biological target I would like to focus on is microRNA. We should all be well aware of what microRNAs are and their prevalence in biology as well as in clinical diagnostics. They are short non-coding RNA, RNAs that play many important roles including oncogenic and tumor suppressive regulation. The beauty of measuring microRNAs for clinical diagnostics is the disability. They are actually very hardy biological targets and can survive multiple freeze-thaw um, requirements as pertain in blood sampling. They're also a lower cost technology that can be developed to detect microRNAs. You can streamline your technology to be more cost effective and high throughput for clinical diagnostics as compared to NGS-based technologies. Also, there's a unique expression profile between normal cells and cancer cells into relation, in relation to one another. You can identify a unique profile for specific cancer types, higher expression, and this then would solidify a biomarker of cancer detection. 
The second biological target is protein. Proteins has actually been a marker that's been well established and been around for a long time as it pertains to diagnostic tools for cancer. And the most common one being used today is CA125. Individual protein markers are significantly limited in terms of sensitivity and specificity, and they are associated with a high false positive rate. Multiple protein mar markers can improve the diagnostic and prognostic accuracy by reducing the number of both false and positives and false negatives. That's why one protein usually signifies one histology or subcancer type. And it's important to utilize multiple proteins in order to be sure that you have a higher sensitivity and specificity, as well as to be sure that you're diagnosing different histologies of cancers for the disease in question. Proteins are really more of an addictive of a global response of cancer. As stated, one protein can detect only one subtype of histology of cancer. And today, in our technology, we utilize multiple proteins, or as like we, we like to say, a multimodal approach to be sure that we are able to have a high sensitivity and high specificity of cancer detection, as well as different histologies of ovarian cancer. So as you can see, there's a need for multiple biomarkers. As stated earlier, no single analyte has a diagnostic sensitivity for gynecologic cancer detection. And in order to be a diagnostic-based test, the rule of thumb is it has to be greater than 95% sensitivity and 95% specificity. If you want a well screening-based test, the rule of thumb is that you want around a 99% specificity in the general healthy controlled population. A multiplex of biomarkers increases this precision and accuracy of cancer detection in the blood. Also, it requires an enriched machine learning AI algorithm approach to be able to parse out these complex relationships between the markers and weight them in a way so that we can show significance of disease detection from non-disease states. Here's a nice example of a proposed framework for integrating multiple analytes and their quantities, fraction, and scores to increase the detection of performance with their sources, analytes, and features that could be used. So for example, in the first stream, it's important that we could take in clinical data, which includes the patient's personal information. It could be symptomology, family history, different hormone levels, their race and ethnicity. Then also looking at multiple proteins, like we stated earlier, a single protein is not weighted high enough on diagnostic accuracy. So utilizing multiple proteins, which can create a risk score to better stratify risk of disease. Can also look at gene panels, look at the germline, look at individuals who are carriers of variants in the germline, and how can that be also combined with risk of other multiple, multiple modalities to ensure a diagnostic-based test as well as microRNAs, as we touched upon earlier, and metabolites. And by utilizing all of these different analyte targets and perform a priority feature selection to identify which of these biomarkers are most powerful in classifying disease, you can rank them based on most to least significant. We can perform standard machine learning steps like building the model, training, and testing to finally classify the sample as having cancer or benign risk. In the next slide, I will discuss a more specific machine learning approach. And these are the applications that we are currently using to date in developing our clinical diagnostics-based test. So here's a primary example of a machine learning algorithm for disease risk and diagnosis that we're utilizing in our laboratory. We're focusing on clinical diagnostic development on building machine learning algorithms that use protein biomarkers, concentrations, to determine early ovarian cancer risk paired with clinical assessment. We're currently exploring other biomarkers, as mentioned earlier, such as microRNA expression levels, genes, and we're also looking into exosome detection to be able to improve our early detection of ovarian cancer risk assessment and move towards a more diagnostic device. Currently, our most promising risk assessment algorithm uses deep neural networks to stratify protein biomarker concentrations into a high and low risk of malignancy in patients that present with an inexal mass. Aspira is collecting specimens from massless patients with asymptomatic patients, healthy controls, and general population 
to improve our machine learning algorithms and the specific aim of improving early stage ovarian cancer detection. This slide gives you a nice snapshot of the benefits of utilizing machine learning and AI for clinical diagnostics. As you can see, there's a nice representation on the left here showing you the complexities that's utilized in machine learning and neural networks that can better recognize patterns in a more higher dimensional space. Each one of these dimensions can be weighted on their significance and can be parsed out on whether or not they can be utilized as a true marker of detection of disease versus normal. These patterns among the levels of many biomarkers such as microRNA, genomic targets, et cetera, can be utilized in this machine learning algorithm. And we can utilize this to better patient evaluation than a clinical assessment alone. In using AI machine learning, it's, we can use it to develop novel techniques and to solve for women diseases early rather than late. And to close, this is really where we're going as an institution, is we really want to come up with technology that is simple, ease of use, has lower economics, and we can target all of these multiple markers in one sampling. And the future is exosomes in clinical diagnostics. Currently, exosomes are being utilized in therapeutic approaches, um, primarily in drug delivery methods. There are complexities still today in purifying exosomes for clinical diagnostic use, and the technology is still being developed for this purpose. However, in the meantime, we're working on early development on how best to utilize these secretory vessels that house all the targets that we want to measure for cancer detection, as discussed previously, such as protein, microRNA, RNA, interleukins, et cetera. And the beauty of this is it would allow us one blood sample, one vesicle, and one test to target one diagnosis, starting with ovarian cancer. So I would like to thank my team for all of their hard work and preparation for this talk today. As you can see, I have an enriched team of scientists from bioinformatics, R&D, data science, as well as a clinical team. It's really important when you're developing clinical diagnostic tests that you have a strong R&D team that can develop the test and and translate that over to a clinical team that can validate it for clinical use. And thank you for your time today. I appreciate it.